Welcome to the Center for Fiction. How many of you are visiting us for the first time this evening? Okay, great. So many of you. So if you don't know much about us, we're in our 200th year. We started as a mercantile library. Uh, we changed to the Center for Fiction because we have a public library in New York City, but we still are a library. You can see some of the books here. If you become a member, you can check them out. You can also use our member space upstairs, um, which is the most beautiful living room that none of us will ever have in New York City to read. Uh, so please check it out and um, get our website and find out the other things that we do here. Um, welcome also to our audience who's joining us via Zoom this evening. Um, we wish you were here, but we're glad that you're there. Um, if everybody would please keep your masks on unless you're on stage and um, except when you're drinking. Um, we will, uh, there is a restroom on this floor. It's against this back wall. Um, and all of your books were generously pre-signed by Gary, but he will also be personalizing books after the event this evening. So if you want to get your book personalized, we'll, we'll line up on this aisle here and go out this door. Um, and for those of you watching on Zoom, you will get signed copies. So we'll also have an audience Q&A this evening. And because there are people watching on Zoom and we're recording it, we will ask for you to come up to the front and ask your questions into a microphone. So um, please do that. And if you're on Zoom, please type your questions into the Q&A by clicking where it says Q&A at the bottom of your screen. And we'll get some of your questions too. And I think that's all I'm gonna tell you. So we've got, uh, this is a part of our storyteller series, which means that we have a professional actor, Frank Wood tonight, who will read. Uh, so you get a taste of the character and the language and the story and the novel. And then uh, Gary and Sloan will come on after that. I'm gonna go ahead and introduce them all to you so that you don't have to hear from me again. Um, so tonight we've got, of course, Gary Steingart. He was born in Leningrad in 1972 and came to the United States seven years later. His debut novel, The Russian Debutante's Handbook, won the Stephen Crane Award for First Fiction and the National Jewish Book Award for Fiction. His second novel, Absurdistan, was named one of the 10 best books of the year by the New York Times Book Review. His novel, Super Sad True Love Story, won the Bollinger Everyman Wodehouse Prize and became one of the most iconic novels of the decade. His memoir, Little Failure, was a National Books Critics Circle Award finalist and a New York Times bestseller. His books regularly appear on the best of lists around the world and have been published in 30 countries. He's joined tonight in conversation by Sloan Crossley. Sloan is the author of the essay collections, I Was Told There Be Cake, Look Alive Out There, which is basically what I said to you earlier. Uh, both finalists for the Thurber Prize for American Humor. How did you get this number in the novel, The Clasp? She served as the editor for the Best American Travel Writing Series and is featured in the Library of America's 50 Funniest American Writers, the Best American Non-Required Reading. And she is a contributing editor at Vanity Fair and a books columnist for the Departures Magazine. But first, to give us a performance from our country friends, we have Frank Wood. Frank won the, both the Tony Award and the Drama League Award for Sideman. He went on to play the, war, the role of Jean on London's West End and in Australia. His Broadway credits include The Great Society, Network, The Iceman Cometh, Clyburn Park, August Osage County, Born Yesterday, and Hollywood Arms. He has many off-Broadway and film credits, and we are thrilled to welcome him to our stage. Please give him a hand. The actor stepped out of the car. He was immediately aware of an audience readying their lorgnettes. He was in no mood. The scenic drive had been endless and most of it had been spent arguing with his girlfriend on the phone. She had been unusually Glaswegian, so it was hard to tell exactly what she was saying, but the fight appeared to be about the timing of the actor's visit to the countryside. And now it had lodged itself firmly in a space usually reserved for nasal headaches. Sandorovsky was rushing toward him in what looked like his thick dress, his lips wine purple, the remaining tufts of his untrimmed hair leaning oddly to the side like a stegosaurus at rest. You're here, he said to the last of his guests. I was so worried you wouldn't come. 
because of your many messages. The actor tilted his head and looked far away as if to say, messages, there were messages. I was just delivering a toast, but now I'll start all over again. But first we go to your bungalow, no? You tell me. Sendorovsky's smile melted in the heat of his guest's indifference. Is that all your luggage? The landowner asked. The actor had slung a duffel bag inscribed with the name of a California winery and resort Ed despised. Only here for a few days. Of course, of course. They went up the path, past the silent porch with its many eyes. Masha could hear Sendorovsky's obedient blather and it made her sad. The idea behind this whole property, the mad idea, I should say, was to create the bungalows on an even plane with the main house. The bungalows are between 500 and 800 square feet each. The largest one meant to accommodate a small family. And the main house has bedroom quarters of about the same space meant for three people, myself, my wife, and my daughter. You'll get to meet them in a second. My wife is a huge fan. In addition, there's a kitchen, dining room and living room with a grand piano that all residents can share. I believe I've heard you play on stage. While we're here, there are no social ranks. Everything's a bit communitarian. Add to the number of people staying at any one time, one other entity, which is our little society as a whole. When I was a child, my happiest memories were of a bungalow colony on the other side of the river catering to Russian immigrants. Cheap, but tidy lodgings, wonderful people, such warmth. And here we are. They were standing at the entrance of a bungalow, adorned by the same gray stucco as the main house. A motion sensor that always ignored Sendorovsky snapped to attention immediately as the actor neared a halogen light spotlighting him and only him. Although I must confess, Sendorovsky continued, that while all bungalows were created equal, this one may be my favorite and my wife's. You'll see why in a minute. He opened the door and turned on a light. The actor could not see why. Maybe it had not been a minute. The walls were covered by rough edged handyman made bookshelves which were filled with volumes, some of them old and foreign. There were framed fussy drawings and photographs of the city he did not recognize. Copenhagen, could it be? A massive drawbridge accepting a carnivalesque cruise ship, an array of homunculi and baseball caps waving from its deck, an orange castle framed by two frozen canals groaning under a blanket of snow no one had asked for a map of a subway system written in an unfamiliar alphabet, the intersection of its green, red, blue, and purple branches forming the occasional parallelogram or backward four. This is the Petersburg bungalow, Sendorovsky announced, the city where my wife and I were born. Huh, the actor said. Is one of those books crime and punishment? That one, Sendorovsky said, stabbing a Cyrillic spine with his forefinger. And a translation is right here next to your bed. You are, of course, welcome to read anything you like. Make a little picnic if you wish and sit in the meadow reading. I can think of nothing better. The actor smiled with his eyes. He was about to tell Sendorovsky some unhappy news and suddenly felt a syringe's worth of compassion for the man whose book he had been adapting for the last half dozen years. Sendorovsky, or Return to Sender, as he and Elspeth had nicknamed him after they'd rejected so many of his drafts, sounded different than he did back in the city or in Los Angeles. The actor did not realize that the bilingual nature of time spent with his wife and daughter inspired in him a different soundtrack. Meanwhile, Sendorovsky enjoyed the actor's smile and the way his presence inhabited the 500 square feet of the Petersburg bungalow. Back in elementary school, a dreadful place for the likes of short, awkward Sendorovsky, students collected glossy informational cards with pictures of animals on them. The most desired card featured a puma resting its head atop its paws, white furred mouth and yellow eyes conveying the height of animal thought and repose. If you flipped the card over, the puma could be seen licking its lips after a successful kill, its tongue reaching up as far as its nose next to a series of statistics that demonstrated how fast the puma was, how sentient, how beautiful and feared. Time spent with the actor with those thoughtful eyes and white mouth always brought that glossy puma card to mind. The vineyard duffel bag fell on the floor with a surprising thud. Listen, the actor said, there's something I have to tell you. I read the latest script. I don't wanna waste any more of your time. I think it's best if we scrap what we have and start fresh. From the beginning, 
Senderovsky could feel his dressing gown come open, the breast modestly covering his heart open for the actor to see, especially a small pink capsule of a nipple. But I thought you said we almost had it this time. I finally diagnosed it, the actor said. I took it apart at the joints. The tone is all wrong for a pilot. We can't lead with humor. We have to build to it over the course of the first three seasons. But the network expects, I'm not interested in the network. They work for us. They answer to us. This, Senderovsky thought, was a profound misunderstanding of the situation. <laughs> I'm going to take a whiz, the actor said. For the second time that night, Senderovsky heard loud urination, a deep country toilet bowl supplying the acoustics of a cathedral. He looked at the framed metro map of a city once called Leningrad. He had not known Masha during the first seven years of his life spent in that city, nor did she know him through her 11. But they were connected by the all important blue line, officially known as M2. Sandorovsky's metro station, Electrosila, literally electric power, was found deep in the charmless and tough nosed southern part of the city. One of its neighborhoods would give the country its current president for life. While Masha's station was Petrokritskaya in the city's Art Nouveau North, the kind of place which might lead to someone saying, there goes a real Petrogradsky intellectual in his slippers and dressing gown. Needless to say, she grew up with the parents Sendorovsky could only dream of, the kind that did not watch the state television of their adopted land with its screaming chirons and grim blonde hosts and unimaginative murderous lies. Masha loved her parents, loved the language of her parents, and wanted Natasha to know the gift of her country's culture. But Senderovsky, despite his Petrogradsky affectations, was still the man from Electrosila. He knew that he had been born in a sick country, a country now intent on spreading its disease to others through the social media channels and under the cover of night, its true gift of the moment. He knew that no matter Masha's intentions, Nat, the wild Arbin child living under their roof would have no room for fermented kvass and red caviar and butter sandwiches and the poetics of Joseph Brodsky and bungalows such as this one. And he knew now that the pilot script would never get done and a check in Los Angeles would never get written. And months later, a year at most, the Sasha Senderovsky bungalow colony would close its doors, much like the scores of Russian bungalow colonies across the river much like the one where he had met his beloved during Masha's first year in this country, fresh off the blue line of the Leningrad Metro, where auburn hair still tied back as if by white school uniform bond. What could he do? How could he please the actor? How could he keep his strange dream alive? Thank you. Do you have a preferred? I'm of the left. Okay, great. I just realized this is super on. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, look wow. at all these people. Gary. I can't believe this. Oh, I just realized that. Oh awesome. my god! Can I take a photo? Do you have a? Oh wow! I have, have a, a computer. A, a, a uh, camera. Oh my god! I can't believe that you're human beings. You're human doing. Oh. Ah, well, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. On this Sloan. book. Thank this you. is a galley. You get a much prettier one if you bought a book. Um, on behalf of your mother, do you know how good this is? It's really good. Really? Yeah, it's really, really I'll good. I'll give you her number. Okay. <laughs> um, so I actually wanted to start um, by asking you, since this is your first event. Yeah. Um, and you know you haven't asked, answered these questions a million times over, so you can answer them fresh. Right fresh yeah. yeah. Uh, who uh, who are all the people? If you could go through the characters <laughs> in this book, because you get a sense from the reading right. um, that there's this sort of colony kind of upstate experience yeah. that to me reminded me a bit of Beato or McDowell. Um, yeah. Uh, I don't know how much you know um, affairs and sex, but uh, yeah, who are the people who come to this place? Uh, well, I think Frank did a lovely job of bringing two of them to life. So there's Sasha Senderovich, who owns um, 
the bungalow colony and um he's a failing russian writer <laughs> where do i get these ideas <laughs> uh, and um, um he owns a bungalow colony now i own a house upstate with one guest house but he owns actually four. So you're different already houses. anticipating the confusion anticipating, between reality. Yeah, okay, just one yeah, house. For I have no imagination. <laughs> <laughs> right, what you know is tattooed on my chest. Um, and uh, he has four bungalows uh, because, as as Frank mentioned, he loved the bungalow colony, the Russian bungalow colony in which he grew up. So uh, during the pandemic, he hosts four different people. Uh, one is Ed Kim, who is the sort of uh, um, son of a Korean Chaebol family. Chaebols are large conglomerates like Samsung or LG. Uh, there's uh, Vinod Mehta, who is his uh, old Gujarati American friend from a math and science high school. I also went to Stuyvesant, so again, I'm just <laughs> not making anything up. Uh, and he's an interesting fella. He, uh, um, wrote a brilliant book, but he'd never quite made it for certain reasons we find out in the book. And he uh, now works for his uh, uncle's diner in Jackson Heights, and uh, he's lost one lung to cancer. So everyone wants him to come up and be safe. Uh, then there is, um, there's three more people I should say. There's uh, D Cameron <laughs> for, <laughs> Uh, horrible, actually, right? By the way, the first the first time I read it, it was only like the third time I read it that I was like, this is actually a very like fluorescent glowing Easter egg. And I, yeah. felt, I felt shame that I didn't pick it up. On the no, no, no. Yeah, a little no, bit. No. <laughs> Who reads <laughs> Focaccia anymore? Oh, that's Focaccia. Uh, Dee Cameron, yes. And she's a very um, fiery Southern essayist. Uh, and she's of the left, like I am here. Uh, but she frequently flirts with the hard right. Uh, because it's, you know, it's 2020, uh, and she desperately tries to keep her books on sale by uh, pro being provocative. Uh, and then there's Karen Cho, who is another classmate of Vinod and Sasha from that special math and science high school, and she runs a very successful app company called True Emotions. Um, and every time two people take a photo of themselves, some of them fall in love desperately, which is what happens in this book. Uh, and the fifth character is the actor whom you just met, who is, according to the Neue Zurich Zeitung, the best thespian in the world. Yes, self-described. Self-described. Yes, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Not, yeah. not wanting for self-esteem. So you put them all together and things happen. You as put you them know. all together and things happen. Yeah, and it did feel that. But what was interesting is, you know, they each... Um, you know, they're all immigrants except for D. D and the actor are both. D and the actor. Yeah. So, so the actor feels like an alien, and she sort of feels like one because she comes from the deep south. Yes. Um, was that always your intent? Yeah. I mean, I we used to I used to belong to this uh, this immigrants club of writers, uh, and there were two Indian Americans, one Russian, myself, uh, one Austrian, uh, one Korean, and one Texan. Mary Carr? The, huh? Is it Mary Carr? No. <laughs> I don't know. Not a major Texan. No. A, a smaller a Texan, Texan. A minor Texan. Yeah, we call them MT. Yeah. 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 They minor. They love that. Yeah, they love that. <laughs> <laughs> They're small states. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no neuroses at all there. And so, yeah, minor Texan was always like, what the hell am I doing here? You know? Yeah. And, and he felt more like an alien within the scope of New York immigrant society. And that's something I think Dee feels the same way. And she constantly complains, oh God, why am I so white? And et cetera, you know, in this um, melting pot of a dacha. Well, there's less, especially in the Northeast and this where the book is set, there's less of a, a drum banging for um, you know, your, your heritage and your culture and you are both welcome and it's assimilation and yet it's, you know, and yet just don't let go of anything sure. and like whatever messages are being sent, it's a constant conversation and um, she's just not in it. She's not in the conversation and, she, <laughs> and to get into the conversation, she needs to be more and more provocative, right. which down the line leads to problems for her that are but she also very escapes, obvious by nature yeah. but she also escapes the city and at one point you talk about you know there being I thought you one of the amazing things about this book is how even though you had one specific experience during COVID as did we all um part of the nature of the beast was not being able to move so whatever your experience is that's pretty much the lane you stayed in um but you really kind of touched down uh on not just the country experience but you talk about you know her leaving the city because it was like a suicide mission to go to the bodega potentially yeah. um but i wonder you know i used to say to friends like 
it's interesting. Now you're only as comfortable as the least comfortable person in the room. <laughs> that's usually me. Right. Well, that's yeah. well, that was my question. Oh, like which, yeah, yeah. which, like, I mean, I feel like it's Masha in the book. Yeah. The main yeah. character's wife. Yeah. Yeah. I should, I should have spoke a little bit more about Masha. Masha's a psychiatrist. Uh, so Sasha really lucked out there because uh, he has a lot of problems. Uh, Is your wife a psychiatrist? My wife is not a psychiatrist. Okay. I mean, I thought you about that. You didn't make anything up. I don't know. I, <laughs> yeah, I thought about marrying a psychiatrist, but I didn't. Uh, That's right. Totally, totally I mean, you know how much money event, I would have Gary? saved? You know, I spent like, spent like 40 grand a year on shrinks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have like three shrinks. Choice. I have a hypnotist and I have a social worker. So uh, that's half my royalties. Um, <laughs> Yeah, Masha is the, Masha is sort of the adult caretaker of this whole thing, and she also, you know, it begins the book. The pandemic is sort of the background for the book, but it begins right. where at the very beginning of March, we didn't know how we were going to catch this thing. We thought, like, looking at each other, we're going to get COVID, you like know? through the app, like through the app, or, or just, you know, yeah, using Facebook, you can get yeah. COVID. But you probably could. Yeah, actually, <laughs> actually, Zucker, <laughs> Zuck's been working on that one. Uh, Insta COVID with your with your NRA registration. Um, um, what the hell was I saying? Sorry. Basically, oh, right. Masha, yeah. Okay. yeah, that's yeah. like, I was just wondering if yeah. you know you found a, a sort of um avatar amongst them for your own neuroses. Yeah, yeah, I think Masha, who was scared to death, uh, and was desperately trying to keep everyone apart so that because you know, these guys they're all old friends, they, they all grew up together, everybody was getting drunk and making out immediately. And Masha's like, let's not do that, you know, yeah. Um, and so she was sort of the referee or the goalkeeper for, for everyone. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think uh, there's, there's, I hope, you know, Dickens is so good at making these sort of types, these archetypes, and then sort of making them spin, right? But right. Um, I, I started with that, and then I said, okay, with 300 pages, I have to myself fall in love with these characters, you know? Wait, 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 wait. For 300 pages, or you were 300 pages in when you decided that? No, no, no I, I said during these 300 pages. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was the, like, the, oh, that's very late. Yeah, that's very late. I'm surprised the book turned out so 17, well. <laughs> 17 pages left, and I was like, you know what? Make these are the real characters. Should these people be redeemable? Yeah. <laughs> likeability is extremely overrated. Yeah. We just um, hate likeability. Right? But they don't. They just don't. want succession on the page. They don't like that. But no. But you know, you mentioned Dickens. Obviously, Chekhov comes up a lot. Yeah. Has already come a lot up a lot in a lot of the reviews. All the reviews. Yeah. In all the reviews, do you see? How can I win? That, yeah, sorry. How can I mean Uncle Vanya is it's all over the freaking place. So there's no there's obviously, you know, you know what you're doing here, but I just I was reading it and the two things that came to mind in addition to the Russians, a little bit Beckett. Huh. Just in the waiting for Godot, but then he shows up. So it was yeah, only a 15 yeah. pages of Beckett. Mm -hmm. Um but then okay. but okay. a lot about a little Point bit taken. like sort of Joycean, just huh. like the setup. Wow. No. That's so interesting. No, just this me. Is, yeah, okay, but I like me. it. I'll take it. I mean, it's it. clearly, it's clearly Chekhov. I'm just. Yeah. No, I mean, huh. Joycean. I just was thinking like the, you know, the Lily, the caretaker's daughter was nearly run off her feet. Like it just oh, felt yeah. like this setup of like hosting at mm. a party and then also the sort of like a uh, universal third person. Oh my God, you're a good reader. I just loved it. <laughs> yeah. You're... I'm not. I loved it. No, that's great. <laughs> that's, I didn't think of that. Wow. But okay. But so no, but so the, but you felt. Yeah. Did you feel like that was a touchstone as you were writing? Check up for in? sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because I kept reading him because to me, I, there's three stories I love. Uh, okay. I mean, I love all of them. But other than the lady with lap dog was just its own kind of brilliance. There's all the stories. I'm trying to translate them into English uh, about love in the banya and gooseberries. Yeah, that's right. I always thought it was the lady of the little dog. No, the, yeah, there's many ways Maybe, to translate. Yeah, Sabachka yeah. in Russian yeah. is a small. <laughs> Um, and then, oh, and also the man in the shell. Okay. okay, so four stories. So those stories are amazing and they're all taking place in the countryside, either in a banya, a, a bathhouse, or just, um, you know, men sitting around drinking vodka as they do. And the men are talking about other men or other couples or other parts of their life. So it's this kind of meta thing that's happening, but in their own way, they're revealing their own um, dis dissatisfaction with life. And they're all of this age. So most of these characters with a few exceptions are in their forties, like myself. Uh, so, um, and this is a great time to really take stock. You know, this is sort of a time where society kind of issues these tickets saying, okay, you did this well, you did that well, you know, and all these characters are taking stock both as, you know. Are you allowed to go to the next level? Are you allowed to go to the next level? It's, it's, it's squid game brought to, you know, it's squid game from intellectuals, right? Uh, <laughs> Squid game. Um, How do you say squid in Russian? Squid, as you know? 
Say it again. A seminok, I think, oh, or is that an beautiful. octopus? I don't know. A seminok, right? That was just right. my own edification. Do yeah. go on, sorry. Igra a seminoga, squid a game. big squid? Yeah. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. Yes. <laughs> I'll stop now. Um, <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, it's the Chekhov. The, the Chekhov, Chekhov. yeah, so I kept reading him and reading him. And, and while I was reading him, um, for some reason, my wife and I fell in love with this Japanese reality show, which also figures in the plot. I don't know if you've heard, I've seen it, uh, Terrace House. Yes, okay, some, nuts. Some, some nuts. Okay, <laughs> thank you. I mean, I really highly recommend it. It's like the antidote to all the American, you know, big brother, big house, big love. It's like low stakes, right? The stakes are tiny. There's like little microaggressions over like a bowl of soba noodles yeah. not served the right way. I mean, you know, <laughs> it's unbelievable. There's a whole episode about the way somebody says the word Costco, whether that means oh, yeah. they want him to go on a date or not. I mean, it's like, it's hilarious. It, and it almost felt like a 19th century Russian novel or short story because everyone is very chased almost no sex happened well uncle vanya takes place on a terrace I, there you go there you go but but yeah. yeah but there's also the it's like palliative care a little bit the television <laughs> watching i mean i feel, i do yeah. feel like you hit i i think i was just so amazed because there is a impulse um that i think a lot of people experience when writing about covid unless they had it which is a different right. kind of narrative um to just go through the checklist. Mm -hmm. And I think it's just incredibly woven in very well where there's, let's say, a mask on the side of the road or you know, there's a paranoia about hand sanitizer. And um, I do wonder though, there were two um, big spots as I was reading this where I thought, you know, it's, it's, like, it's like watching Titanic where you're like <laughs> something, I know what's gonna happen yeah, and this can yeah. be suspenseful within it, but yeah. something's gonna happen. And the two, aside from the, the stakes of it, just COVID specific spots where I was like, how is he gonna handle this? Is he gonna handle this? Did um, you did, okay. in what I'm about to say. Yeah, you did. One is the guilt that everybody feels. And there's a chapter right dead smack in the middle yeah. where the guilt that everyone feels in the country about what they're hearing about what's going on in the city. Yeah. Um, and then the other is, and I, I, you did this very well, I thought, um, was Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. And I wonder as you were writing this, mm -hmm. When did you write those parts and how was it as it was happening? Yeah, it was as, as it was happening. As so, it was happening. Yeah, yeah the, the chapter that deals with the way people interpret what happened in, in, yeah. in Minneapolis was written about two weeks, I think, after it happened. Right. And, and, and brought up. So, yeah, and, and that's really two senses of guilt. One was the first sense of guilt was, I mean, I do spend most of my time upstate. So I, I feel like, you know, I, I feel a little bit more of an upstater than New Yorker, but I still felt guilty. Right. Of being there and not and not here, right. you know. But you have uh, a do you have an apartment here? I do have an apartment here. Yeah, yeah. But I, I do spend the majority of time. Right. I, I can only write upstate. I can't write in New York anymore. So, but yeah, I did have that guilt, and also a lot of my best friends, just like in the book, live upstate permanently, um, and we all felt a little bad about the situation right. because it felt like we were just removed from this source of. Because it was very safe up there, you know. You drove up to a right. grocery; all your bags were laid out at the front door. Right. You put them in your car and you drove out. There was almost no contact with anyone else. And also, we got to enjoy ourselves because we did form these little pods because we were so isolated. In, in the like world. genuine pods, genuine not the pods. sort of BS LA pods. No, where no, they're no, like, no, oh, no, I'm on a pod with 25 people. Yeah, no, 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 no. We had a, <laughs> we had a, we had a five person pod, but even that right. made life really bearable. Yeah, you know, and especially I have an eight year old kid, and he got to socialize a little bit and play with his little friends and. It was very, very, very sweet, and, and that, but that made me feel guilty too over over that because I knew that people in New York weren't leaving their apartments. And the other source of guilt, uh, yeah, after um, after Floyd was the guilt. It was a strange kind of guilt. It was sort of the feeling that a lot of my immigrant friends and myself had about how we fit into this narrative. Obviously, we, you know, we aren't rooted in this country in the same way that that, that some people are, you know, on, on, on both sides of that equation. But at the same time, you know, one of the uh, the policeman who stood by and, and watched it happen was an immigrant, mm -hmm. uh, and sort of so that begins. Sasha begins to think of what his own role in all of this is: how he was brought to America, told to succeed, and sort of deputized to take sides right. between you know between you know the oppressor and the oppressed. Like a scarab or something. A scab, yeah, scarab, yeah, exactly. Scarab. scarab. What? <laughs> yeah, that would be very poetic. No, uh, yeah, he feels like a scab. <laughs> <Same thing>. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. yeah, I mean, I just think it was handled well, and I was just, I just kept wondering, and I think a lot of people will wonder as they're reading this, sort of, when, when was this written? Because I think that, you know, I, uh, we were talking about this over email in advance, I had mm -hmm. written a piece mm -hmm. um, 
just really hit the buzzer extremely hard in uh, early March oh, like of 2020, being just as a sort of self-assigned uh, police officer of the literary <laughs> world, being like, if any of you write a novel about this, yeah. I'm gonna come kill you. That's right. And I just, that I, literally is the language. Yeah. Who am I to say these such things? No, it was incredible. I, know. I, I, started, I don't know yeah. what uh, B um, got in my bonnet, um, yeah. uh, but uh, I think I just sort of saw it coming and I I did not see this coming though. This is just fantastic, but it was such a, um, it's, it's just a, such a tight rope to walk and you do but it Your so essay well. was such an inspiration because as I, after I read it, at first I thought, oh shit. <laughs> but my second feeling is I got to make this real good or Sloan will kill me. Or Sloan's going to come to my, be my yeah, yeah, before uh, when I asked if you had an apartment here, where is it? <laughs> exactly. It just, it's on uh, Staten Island. Good luck finding it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just take the ferry and ask for Gary. <laughs> kind of rhymes. And it rhymes. It's it rhymes. beautiful. But I guess um, I said the other the other feat, in addition to the timeliness, yeah. is so uh, what you have is something that captures sort of the boredom and malaise yeah. of COVID yeah. without ever being boring. And the two sort of obvious, if we're going to do the Chekhov's gun thing, because how can we not? Uh, COVID. Yeah, as COVID you know, has to go it's off. It's got to go off eventually. Um, but do you think there, how were there others along the way that you were like, okay, how do I keep on making drama within this small group? Yeah, it was really hard in the sense that, I mean, the, the, the interperson drama wasn't that hard. Look, eight people put together, yeah. stuff's going to happen. It is I a mean, reality show. Yeah, it is a reality show. You know, if you go to, uh, there's these artists colonies, Yaddo and McDowell, right? Yeah. And people actually know that if you want to, you know, if you want to have an affair, you go to McDowell. Is that true? It's true. Well, that explains why nothing happened at Yaddo. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> McDowell is for affairs and Yaddo is for eating roast beef. Yeah. Uh, so those well, are, I didn't do that either. Yeah, Great. Can, okay, yeah. keep going. So sorry. it's completely different things. <laughs> um, but yeah, but with you, but all the time you put together, I mean, that's why there's so many college novels, because, you know, if you put together people right. in a dorm, et cetera, stuff's going to happen. Um, and uh, so that part wasn't hard. It was, you know, the hardest part in some ways was writing about nature, which I'd never really done before because everything I write is so urban. Uh, huh. But here I really had to slow down and, you know, I had to, I know nothing. You know, I would ask my friend, you know, what, what is this? And he would say, <laughs> tree. And I'd say, ah, tree, tree. I wonder though if that's something that's it might connect. Um, I wish you to get a couch. So it's really therapy here. Um, it might connect to something larger that I was going to ask you yeah. about, only because you said that, and it reminded me of an interview I heard with Roz Chast once, mm. in which she said she just hated drawing trees, couldn't stand it, doesn't like drawing mm. nature. Like the idea of drawing a forest is just why. Mm. And I wonder if there's something where you get so into the humor groove that uh -huh. nature seems almost self serious. Nature's really serious, except uh, where I live, and he became a character in the book, there's a groundhog named oh, Steve. Right. Um, <laughs> Steve is an actual groundhog. He is hilarious. He's some kind of like weird tech libertarian, I think, because he's, <laughs> he's boring into everything. He's built like seven different, he has like a summer Riviera by the pool and a Christmas winter he's house. He's disrupting the internet. He's disrupting the internet. Literally. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he's a real jerk and he destroys a lot of the property um and 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 he's always like sometimes i see him on the pool deck and he's like literally lying there in a stupor his, <laughs> his fat fat belly up there uh, i don't know so nature can be funny nature can in, be funny, in, in yeah. a form of, of, of groundhogs and stuff uh there's actually a whole service on our side of the river pretending that they cage the groundhogs and then take them over the river and then release them but clearly they're stew somewhere that's what is, my parents used to tell us yeah, not about the ground yeah. but the, 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 they released the bunny upstate onto your property and, <laughs> no yeah. we we ate him yeah um, <laughs> there's no question we ate him um, oh, snuggles <laughs> but yeah um but yes nature itself is not that funny yeah. so but beyond that i just I, not to interrupt but just i mean i think i think eventually i was going to ask you essentially like you know you you write humor in a way that almost no one else does um, and the fact that you, you know, a humorous novel is, is hard to come by, at least a literary one. Yeah, yeah. And I feel like you, to me, it reads like you make people laugh. And then especially in this book, more than even your others, just as they're laughing hysterically, you sort of like jab them in the spleen, make yeah. them cry. It's yeah. great. You'll love it. <laughs> Get ready to be spleen jab. Uh, but do you, do, do you feel yeah. like it has to be, um, do you ever feel self-conscious about it? Do you ever feel like you have to put the medicine in applesauce? Kind of well, to, dis to discover this, I'm actually going to teach a course next year at Columbia on humor called, do you want to be funny? Question mark. <laughs> so you want do you want to be funny? <laughs> yeah. um, or so you think you're funny. I can't remember. One of those. So you think you can dance? So you think you can just dance? Just call it that. Yeah. 
Um, um, and I want to sort of see how humor works and doesn't. And for me, humor works. I can't read a novel that's just drama and tragedy. I just, right. I can't do it. I can't, I've done it. I mean, some of them are great. Sorry. Uh, for someone who likes the Russians so much. But the Russians are always funny. Even Dostoevsky, yeah, in, as, I don't know how they translate it, but Dostoevsky is funny. Tolstoy can be funny. There's a lot of comedy of manners kind of going on there. Yeah, that's true. Uh, Chekhov, I think, is funny in his yes. own very droll way. Um, but I think, and I use this analogy, you know, so your humor is the ICBM missile, if I'm going to get all Cold War here. But tragedy is the warhead, right? So uh -huh. the humor gets it over into, you know, Smolensk or whatever you're trying to bomb. And the tragedy is the destruction of that city. And you your know. readers in this scenario are? <laughs> the reader is, yeah. Um, <laughs> thank you for destroying this whole analogy. Sorry. The reader is, uh, you're, uh, maybe you're doing for uh, the day after that movie? You didn't see yeah. it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I've seen the day after. You said that? OK. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The reader is that, you know, when they run out and like, oh my god, oh, they've the done light. it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's the reader, hopefully. <laughs> Okay, so that's so that's that's the analogy. Yeah, that's sorry. the analogy. No, yeah. it's it's a good one. It's good, yeah. but it's just. I mean, I think the thing is, it's um, it's done with great success here, and it's done. I guess what would be then on? Um, we're we're going to get to your New Yorker article in a oh bit. Boy. But what would be on the warhead? What would be on the warhead? <laughs> Sorry, I was jumping ahead slightly. Okay. The, the word is the tragedy. No, I know. Yeah. But is it just because, in other words, you have this, um, you know, the book only in the in the sort of final quarter, I don't want to ruin anything, oh, okay. but, you know, COVID, and I think some of the reviews have said this, uh, so I don't feel so bad. Spoiler alert. Well, not super spoiler. Mm -hmm. It does sneak in. Mm -hmm. The bubble cannot stay on the bubble. Yes, that's right. That's right. Um, but for me, I also felt like that there were other sort of subtle themes. There's a lot of nostalgia. There's a lot of nostalgia for New York in the mm. early aughts that I thought yeah. was really beautiful. Thank that you. is sort of the foundation of their friendship. Yeah. yeah. And so it's not, to me, yes, it's a COVID novel and yeah. I hate to be hokey, but it is about, it's really a found family friendship novel. Yeah, you know, I mean, I think that the pandemic brought about many emotions, obviously anxiety and isolation, but also I think a kind of nostalgia uh, yeah. because all of us were just left with, with ourselves. And I, I, I hadn't talked on the, como se dice, el telefono, the telephone, right? I haven't talked on that in so long because it's all, uh, or yeah, you but you're a 90s kid. This is what we, we were yeah. trained for this. We were trained for the telephone and the telephone <laughs> came back. I started talking yeah. to peeps on the phone. Yeah. I would put in the, um, you know, plug. Uh, yeah. And, and, uh, now you're having me do it, and that's sorry, not good. No. Just, uh, <laughs> okay. cozy. Yeah. And then I would talk to them, and we would remember so many things. We would remember such crazy memories, and I, I put a lot of them in there. There's a party that takes place at the end of this novel. Um, but uh, talking to my friends, um, is that the Florent party? There's a Florent party. Florent was a wonderful diner. Yeah, some of you remember it. Look yeah, the there's wave, a lot of Florent the scenes. The wave of recognition. The wave of recognition. God bless you. I miss readers. Oh, <laughs> readers who love Florent. What can be better? I know. Um, and then I live not far from here. I, I, I was dating this woman a long time ago who was living in this mansion on the Calb. And for a while, I was an inhabitant in that mansion, and we would throw these hilariously ridiculous parties where. How how does she come into the mansion? I don't know. She had a nose for real estate. Um, okay. <laughs> I'm always impressed by people like that. I usually live in a box. I'm very yeah. bad at it. There's a yeah. skill set. They can it's look at the same, set. yeah, you know, same pieces of information, same listings, and go. I should have gone to real estate school instead of Oberlin. God. Yeah. <laughs> Where did I go wrong? I almost went to the Cornell School of Hotel Management. That could have given me a... Well, that actually explains uh, why there's yeah. a hospitality element to the... Yeah, <laughs> I love hospitality. I love throwing well, the parties. Food. Yeah, the food. The food. I, I mean, I feel like what's funny is that, like, I, I'm going to ask all these questions or am asking these questions about these broad themes. Yeah. And the only way to really, like, uh, give people a sense of this book, I can't do it because I almost, like, you know, sprain my wrist underlining mm -hmm. the phrasing The just... Um, there was one... Uh, the food phrasing is what made me think of this. Mm. It was just like if you read Lake, Lake Success and you imagine like the watch descriptions now <laughs> transferred to like Barada. Right. Right. Be beautiful. Right. Just <laughs> gorgeous. But do you actually, but I feel like um, That's funny. you also handle, I think, uh, and, I, and I hate to use such a sort of blanket topic or, or term, but you handle privilege very well. Mm -hmm. Like I don't, I read your stuff or I read like Nora Ephron stuff, I read this kind of stuff, and I don't think. Oh, well, of course you have the very expensive bath oil. Of course, it just somehow, and I wonder if it's the, the immigrant experience. I think so. Experience. I mean, I, I grew up very poor uh, on a sort of, you know, uh, government cheese type situation. We didn't have any money. Uh, we were on benefits. Uh, and 
I went to a school for very rich kids, not very rich kids, but middle to upper middle class kids. And I didn't speak the language. I had just, you know, one giant fur coat made out of some Soviet beaver or something. And, <laughs> you know, I, the, the gradients in status became very apparent to me in my whole life. I've been sort of attuned to them. And, and I then think, you went to Oberlin. And then I went to Oberlin. Well, yeah. Like roundhouse kicked that. You're yeah, like, <laughs> yeah. No, by, by the time I got to Oberlin, I actually started buying, you know, somewhat middle-class clothes. And there I was like, what are you wearing? Because people <laughs> literally were wearing like janitor's outfits. You know, there was a guy, you know, with an outfit, you know, it said Bob on his lapel. And I was like, hey, Bob, you know, and I was like, poor Bob, you know, he has to wear his janitor outfit. And he's like, my name is Jim. <laughs> And I'm like, no, it says Bob. And he's like, oh, you That's are cool. not cool. <laughs> okay. um, but all those things, <laughs> all those things became sort of, uh, and I think all of my other novels explore that too. Once you grow up poor yeah. in this country, because growing up poor in America, you're not just poor. It's like considered a moral failing. Like, you know, you did not worship your God enough or something. Do you still think that's true? That people treat people like that? In America? Oh, of course people treat people yeah. like that. But no, I'm I don't saying, think it's a moral failing. No. <laughs> no, I'm just saying how. Are we all going to hell? Yes or no? Just to tell us. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, I just think that there's a weird, weird way it's almost like fetishized now. The, like that's how like D in the book right. is very like yes. she clings to this sort of yes. like no 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 yeah I you know I cannot I cannot possibly yes. be uh, considered an oppressor yes at because one point, I come yeah. from right. a really right. hard scrabble background right at one point D demands that everyone in the table produce their net worth on a napkin and then people could analyze that and group yeah, uh, yeah I mean <laughs> this, this is after some bad things happened to her online and she needs to get back but this is the spikes of what you would do over COVID in that in that scenario or just like very realistic um but uh I was going to pan out slightly do you feel and maybe maybe the answer is neither and this is just me superimposing my own junk on you but why not if not in front of others yeah. <laughs> we could do this over we can do this over today, drinks or drinks. we could do it I feel personally uh that fiction is much more vulnerable to me than non-fiction mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, does that, do you not know what I'm talking about? I think the reason that I know what you're talking about, and I think it's because there's still the veneer that it's fiction, even though so much of what I read, knowing the people that wrote it, is a complete autobiography. Right. You know, uh, but it allows Beyond us. Beyond autofiction. You know, my friend Akhil Sharma, I don't know if you read mm -hmm. An Obedient Father, if anyone's read that book, absolutely brilliant book. Um, it's so incredibly vulnerable, but knowing Akhil well, I also know that 90% of it was true. I mean, but you can hide, but he, you can, yes, you can hide under that thing, a novel, you can hide in front of your parents if they're still alive. You can, mm -hmm. you can do a lot of that, that little thing, a novel does a lot of work in terms of creating, in terms of allowing that vulnerability to show and into saying, well, it's not, it's not me, you know, um, but so yeah, absolutely. I, I, I a little agree. like puppet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is there stuff in the, in this particular book that you feel like was you could never have written about otherwise in a different format? Because you have it based. I mean, it's based on um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. a real time period. I think it's the you know it's it's that there's such vulnerability toward friends in this book, and I have a lot of. It's not like my friends aren't vulnerable toward one another, but we rarely acknowledge just how much we mean to each other. A lot of us come from. Um, either immigrant backgrounds or very difficult backgrounds in one way or another. And in some ways, a lot of our parents weren't there for us, not because they're awful people, but because they simply couldn't understand what was happening. They didn't, couldn't impart good life advice, so to speak, because they came from horrifying societies, you know, and they just didn't know, you know, I mean, I remember my friend, um, an Indian American friend, his, his dad would say, well, no one will ever love you because you have low muscle tone. Uh, so you might as well become an engineer. <laughs> Whatever that means, right? But that was life advice. Um, um, <laughs> should have gone to real estate. Yeah, you should have gone to real estate. And, you know, and um, stuff like that. I heard stuff like that all the time. You know, become an accountant. But mom, I don't know how to add two simple numbers. Yeah. No, you have to do it. Um, just the practical. Just just the, practical. So, I mean, I got that just being Jewish. Yeah, maybe so. Like, okay, so but being both Jewish, Russian, immigrant, I mean that. Uh, yeah, no, you win. You win. No, it's an explosive, horrifying <laughs> thing. I mean, there's, no, there's no way out. There's no way out. Um, but I think we began to, our friendships were so tight because we became parents to one another in a way right. too. We would sort of really help each other out. You know, we would take different things. I would help as the writer. I would help people write resumes when they were applying to you know some temp job or whatever. Right. And a friend of mine saw that I was dressing terribly and took me to Screaming Mimi's and bought me a lot of denim crap. And yeah, Screaming Mimi's gets a shout out. Screaming too. Mimi's gets it was a just, shout just a, it's really truly really amazing how much yeah. how much of uh, yeah. New York is folded in and the, and the fever dreams. Yeah, yeah. Towards the end, all of yeah. it. 
Yeah, New York. I mean, look, yeah, as I said, I felt guilty about not being there, but it also, I, I was there for like a year and a half upstate, so I really began to miss it. Well, you're also who you are. I mean, that's the thing. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. You know, you took yourself with you. Um, a little bit, though, the, the sort of um, thing that's thrown into this mix of people and these immigrants is, um, well, how are we on time? Are we okay? Am I babbling? I don't know. Um, someone will tell us. They'll start playing mm -hmm. disco music, and that's how we'll know. Um, squid disco music. Mm. <laughs> oh. Um, uh, the actor. Yes, the actor. Yeah. The actor. Yeah. Okay, so a little bit, you know, we heard from the beginning. Yeah, um, yeah. Was that always in the book? Yeah, I've always wanted to have somebody who... So there's a woman who owns this incredibly successful app business, Karen, who's an old friend of theirs. But America treats its celebrities in a whole different way. They're almost, you know, because we don't have a monarchy, they're almost godlike and they're followed with a kind of godlike uh, fervor. And they're allowed to do really whatever they want, you know, and the actor does wreak incredible havoc on so many, breaks so many hearts and does so many other horrifying things throughout. And nobody really bats an eyelash except toward the end where yeah. finally there's a little bit of a comeuppance. But, um, but yeah, that came out of my time. I've worked in LA as, a, you know, writing of the script. Yeah, all uh, center space. Yeah, <laughs> final draft. Um, so, uh, and I've met my share of actors and just yeah. watching the way they interact with yes. everyone and, 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 and with myself. How you know. it affects, I mean, what's funny is I think what's so brilliant is the portrayal. It's, it's long enough and it's given enough space and that's what's great is without uh, ever dragging on, everyone is given enough room where you treat him with incredible empathy um, and you realize that this is not only just poisonous, poisonous to us yeah. to treat people like real royalty, but yeah. how much it really gets to him. I mean, and it's, it's hilarious. I mean, there's a lot of parts where he, you know, he refers to himself as a writer. He just hasn't started yet. Yeah. And, <laughs> um, doesn't he call himself Odysseus right off the bat? He calls himself Odysseus quite a lot. Oh, quite uh, a lot, yeah. Yeah, it gets into a fight about <laughs> subtext without quite understanding the word. Uh, yeah, it's a lot of good stuff. But yeah, you, you know, I mean, I've, it's a strange life I've led because in the last decade or so, I've, I've met a lot of priv very privileged people. Um, mm. uh, my last book, Plague Success, I had to hang out with a lot of billionaires to right, research course. that. Watch collectors. Watch collectors, oh God. Um, <laughs> Um, and, and, you know, um, most of them are quite miserable. There were a few who weren't, but right. there were a lot of very, very miserable people who are still being pursued by their parents. Nothing was ever good enough, right. you know, uh, and I felt the same way about some of the actors I met that they too, uh, felt like, I mean, they, they were under so much, I mean, they were so angry underneath it all. Well, there's no room to be upset. Yeah. Yeah. There's no you forget who you are, I think, when, when you're that yeah. successful. You, you forget the very rudiments of, of, of society and civilization. It just But you're told just enough. And that's what's sort of interesting about the book, too, is that, I mean, everybody has to sort of go back to their roots in the book um, yes. and to sort of address, you know, obviously old wounds and the things that you might imagine that would happen. But I think part of what's so brilliant about that in particular, and I think what the reviews have picked out, too, is that uh, you really capture how, like, they are told just enough. <laughs> um, that yeah he probably in whatever social circle that this character is in is the smartest one yes yes and it just confuses that for being transferable for being transferable yeah to a group of academics or a group of writers right, or a right. scientist right exactly <laughs> wherever he would go he would be he would still be the actor yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Um, and, and social media plays a role in all that uh, it is yeah uh, that's also well so oh it's brightening yeah, slightly it's brightening. which means that that's how i know yeah, okay. but can i ask one more question one before more? we okay. open it up to everybody else and that is the um one of those also a perspective of the main couple's child mm -hmm. in here that's really amazing again it's it's sort of this like third person thing and the the details on her are just unbelievably good like you know when you talk about her looking in a mirror at some point and you imagine you know you have a adult who looks in a mirror and notices you know what's going on here yeah. and she's just sort of like pleasantly surprised that she woke up again and there she is you know it's just like what you think when you're a kid mm -hmm. that like sleep has passed mm -hmm. um but i asked you a little bit backstage uh, she's obsessed with BTS, yeah. <laughs> the Korean pop. How, uh, so, so to write this, how much um, Korean pop music did you listen I, I, to? I, it was a lot of BTS. Did you listen or you just Googled? I, I would watch the videos because you the videos are videos. absolutely fascinating. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting. They're, <laughs> look, I mean, I think there's some sweet kids. These I'm, not, I'm uh, not disparaging no, no, the, I'm not the children. I would never disparage. <laughs> 
I know we're not the strategy, but Jin and J-Hope especially. Oh, so cute. You know what? That, that totally answers my question more than I could ever have hoped for. I really started falling for them. Yeah. Oh, I think, okay. you know, like, I, they're just lovely and their politics are great. Yeah. They're just, I know that a lot of this is positioning and, and there's a lot of people m manipulating them, but I really wish them the best. They're just yeah. lovely. <laughs> well, I wish, I wish that, you know, in a different version of this novel, Nat, the kids' dreams could have been made that instead of the actor, one of the BTS oh members my God. have shown up. Oh my and God. she would have just lost her mind. I would lose my mind. I would lose my if, mind too. If and I, I ever even got know. to, oh my God. I want to sell Korean rights so desperately to just go oh there. Oh my gosh, you should. Yeah. I say that as if that's something you hadn't considered. Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay, uh, we're going to open it up to okay. other people's questions that can or cannot be about Korean pop music or just about the novel. Okay. Or, or any other recent Anything else? Oh, we also, I, we never even touched, if you will, yeah, on your article. A New Yorker article, yeah. yeah. Feel Whoops. free to ask about that as well yeah i don't know um, this seems like a crowd that's read it i don't know so yeah audiences can um and if you want to take a if you want to ask a question you can make a line in front of the mic over there as people are considering their questions and forming a line i'm going to ask one question from zoom from margaret oh. which is did one or more of your characters surprise you while you were writing this wonderful book can you tell us who and when and how? Uh, Thank you for sharing your gifts. Yeah. And feel free, everyone else, to that's stand a, up and get online to ask oh, a question. That's a sweet question. Yeah, I think I was most surprised by Masha. I don't want to give away too much, but someone hits on Masha, one of the characters. I, Masha is the- It's what, not me. Is, I'm not, <laughs> it's not you. Okay. Would you like to? Sure, she's great. Okay. Um, someone hits on Masha and her response uh, was unexpected. At first I thought it would be very much, uh, you know, oh, I'm married, you know, uh, but it became more complicated as I wrote it. And I think as I first started writing it, I wanted her, because it's so, it goes so much against her type to, to do something like this. She's a psychiatrist. She understands, you know, the ramifications of everything. And also the person who's hitting on her is kind of being a jackass at this time, you know? But she develops, it was fun for me to sort of go through her process of mind in allowing herself and proving to herself that after all she's been through, she deserves a little something. Um, and, um, and, and somehow um, that, that line of thought encompasses the German film, The Lives of Others. Oh yeah. Yeah, which is an incredible film. Great her film. ultimate, one of my favorite films of the last 10, 20 years. And uh, the ultimate justification for what she's about to do comes from the last line of that film. Uh, and I didn't know I was going to go there, you know, I mean, because you don't wake up and say, oh, I'm going to quote a film about East Germany in 1990 and about the Stasi. I but mean, the, yeah, you do. No, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> you think, okay, I'm going to quote Battlestar Galactica for sure. Today, sure, yeah, okay. <laughs> but no. So yeah, that, that was surprising. And her character arc was a little surprising to me. Character arc, God, I'm so LA. Oh. No, but it's, I mean, character it's, arc. it's a benefit. Yeah. Questions or concerns? Or, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry, we're making you come. Normally it would be less exposed. Okay, two people, good. No, if just somebody one. else is getting okay. up, I might ask two quickly. Please. Um, you mentioned in the New York Times article that um, you had started another book and you were pretty deep into it. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit, I mean, how, speaking of like having to start over from scratch, right? Yeah. How tough was that? Well, okay. What, I, what that article didn't mention is actually there, was, there were two other books I abandoned before this. Uh, and it was interesting what they each contributed to the, the final the thing I embarked on. At first, I was really writing about a novel in which uh, Russia had pretty much taken over America in about 50 years from now and imposed a kind of nobility system, like the 14 ranks that were under the czar. Uh, you know, um, privy counselor, titular counselor, all that kind of stuff. Um, and I started, I wrote about 70 pages and I sent it to my agent and my agent is brilliant. And, and she was like, what is this? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I, re I read it myself and I was like, this makes no sense. So I stopped that. That was great. So that was before uh, COVID. That was way before COVID, okay, yeah. right. That was like two years before COVID. Then I started writing a book, yeah, where NYU had taken over most of Manhattan. I love that. Uh, which, which it has. now running way. it as a kind of personal fiefdom with like, instead of like blue helmets, they had like, you know, velvet helmets. <laughs> um, and then there was some kind of time travel thing. I don't know. Um, and I wrote about 240 pages. Oh, David oh Byrne God. was a major character. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, yeah. You know, I, I tried so hard. Will, will you ever, will that ever see the light of day? I don't know. So then, okay. So 
it was kind of, you know, a dystopia light. And then, uh, and then when this dystopia hit, plus remember a certain president was still in office. Uh, so the combination of all that source, I was like, what am I doing with, you know, velvet helmets? I was like, <laughs> send in the velvet helmets. They sound great. <laughs> NYU, rule me. You know, all right, my, one other quick my... one. I'm just curious. Yeah. Has Hollywood come a calling for you to adapt this? And this, if they did? Yeah, they're, they're sort of, you know, exploratory little nibbles, yeah. but they're a little like, we get, when you get to the end, one, one very big filmmaker was very interested and then he's like, but what am I gonna do with the end? Because, you know, endings are very chipper in, in LA, mm. you know, because there's never any pain in that whole county. Um, <laughs> So, but we'll see. We'll see. I, I, I do. I do think film would be great for this. Not, I don't see this so much as a series, but who knows? I mean, yeah. but yes, I would love to. And I love writing scripts and stuff. So, yes. But thank thank you. you for asking. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hi. Um, Hi. Thank you for this for this new book. It sounds amazing, and I can't wait to read it. Um, I, I hope you don't mind if I go back to just a question of. Um, of a scene in uh, Super Sad True Love Story. Sure, I remember that Thank book. you. <laughs> <laughs> Vaguely. Uh, it's, yeah. it's the scene that's been haunting me uh, oh. lately. I, I, I can't get out of my head. Oh, um, it's, it's, I think it took place in, in Tompkins Square Park uh -huh. where the veterans squatted in the park yeah. and kind of took it over from their own yeah. kind of uh, precursor to what happened in the, the Wall Street, right? The, yeah. the anyway, yeah. issue. Um, and Eunice and her father go down and, yeah. and, and, and help out. Yeah. And the David character is a veteran and yeah. it's kind of a leader of the veterans group yeah. in, the, in the park. Um, and at one point in conversation, David says to Eunice, um, you know, we made a mistake. We were afraid to fight each other. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and uh, the, the wider point of what he's, he's making is, the the divide in America. Yeah. Are afraid we're afraid to fight each other. Yeah. The red states and the blue states. If you you were you were way ahead of that. Um, yeah, a lot of um, stuff which, in which that book, great, sadly if you don't mind true. me saying a great yeah. satirist yeah. will will do. Yeah. Um, such as yourself. And yeah. and what so that I mean that that that's that scene mm -hmm. that stays with me in what we're mm -hmm living through thank um, you yeah what yeah. um what did you mean by it why did you write it that why did you when i was what? researching that book in in the mid aughts um it was the beginning of social media and i was starting to see you know and i had a great intern really sexy intern we called him the man turn um <laughs> oof, he was hot all my friends fell in love with the man turn um but he introduced me to uh social media and from the moment I went on, and this was the, bud, the first buddings of Facebook, but also MySpace, if you remember that thing was happening. And I could somehow, I don't know what it was. There was something so dystopian about what was happening. And I could see that things were, that I, I, from the moment, you know, I, I looked at it, I thought this can't be good in terms of getting people to talk to each other, in terms of getting people to interact. You know, uh, uh, even, the, even upstate, we live in these farms these old farms, and we're completely separate. You know, you, you walk by our street, there's houses huddled together. This is all mentioned in the book, which have Blue Lives Matter signs. Then you have huddles, houses huddled together with hate has no home here signs. Um, and I think before that, people would interact before the social media and, and also the their extensions in Fox News. And obviously in that book, there's like 20 different Fox channels, you yes. know, Fox yes. Liberty Ultra, Ultra, and, Ultra. And, and, and there are at least two now. Yeah, there's at least two now, right? So, you know, I, I began to see, as somebody who grew up in a superpower that splintered apart in the mid aughts, even though, you know, I, I, we weren't at the worst of it, I, I began to sense this is not going well. And I, also all these, especially when you went more inland, you'd see these gigantic flags flying everywhere. And I remember those flags in the Soviet Union, you know, the bigger the flag, the more insecure a country is, I think about its future. Mm. And, 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 and all of that went into the mix of, of super sad and, and produced that dystopia, a, a lot of which unfortunately has, has come true. So, yeah, but thank you for asking. Sorry, just quick follow up. Sure. But David in, in the, thinks there should have been a, 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 a final final blow 
Yeah, which I don't so quite agree with him there. Okay. Uh, I don't agree with him there. Uh, actually, you know, it's so funny is um, today, uh, the columnist Michelle Goldberg in the Times wrote a great piece about how instead of coming to blows, we should actually all step aside, you know? And about, I, I kind of like that. It's sort of the anti-David speech in a way. And, and David, I think, can be wrong about this. But the idea that, you know, people were perfectly fine 20 years ago. You know, you, you, you want to go to church, go to church. You know, you want to go to your, you know, Omega Institutes and, and, and do, you know, face downwardly dog style, do it, you know, who cares? Different people are different people, but now everything is a signifier. Everything is a call to arms, right? So that's, I think the difference, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. You don't mind being called a prescient satirist, do you? Prescient satirist, as long as it's not precious satirist. Uh, yeah. <laughs> He's like, you don't mind, do you? <laughs> not at all. I, uh, okay. Yeah, so my, uh, my, Parents are also uh, Russian immigrants. My my Ooh. mom's from Leningrad. Oh, uh, nice. And I, yeah, and Jews also. Jews. So We're I, here to talk I, about I language. Of, uh, Leningrad <laughs> Jews comes from parents. I, I know all of that. Yeah. So, uh, so you know, a lot of your writing is like resonated a lot with oh, me. Thank I you. I feel like I've had some of the same <laughs> like issues. And yeah, whatever. issues. Um, and so- <laughs> but lightly, yeah. Right, yes, exactly. Uh, and so Little Failure in particular, kind of, uh, you know, I've, I have like a close relationship with that book. And so yeah, what I was really curious about is uh, whether you found the experience of writing that book kind of cathartic at all in terms of your own uh -huh. relationships with your parents. And, mm. you know. huh. Yeah, Little Failure, interesting. Um, I was blessed in terms of my parents that that is the only book I've written so far that hasn't been translated into Russian. Ah, okay. And, wow. And their English is, you know. Was that intentional? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> I think Russians were like, memoir, what is this? You live, you die. Why write about it? Why complain? Why yeah. complain? <laughs> Life is miserable, we know. Yeah. So <laughs> this guy thinks something happened to him. Um, <laughs> but I wrote it when I was 39 because I have a memory problem, uh, which I hope isn't an early Alzheimer's or anything, but I forget everything. I think it's two decades of a lot of... Um, so by the time I was in my 30s, I actually did start to forget a lot of stuff. And I thought, if I don't write this now, it's all going to be forgotten. Um, and it's interesting, you know, even today, like when I, I mean, going back to this book, you know, I, I would get phone calls from friends and we would talk for hours. I would go on my country walks and talk for hours and they would remind me of things I'd completely forgotten because my memory is so weak, you know, oh, we used to lie on bed and watch the Simpsons together, but we talk it to each other on the phone, on the landline, you know, which happens in which two characters mentioned in the book too. So, um, I, but also I wanted to write the memoir because I think you know, there's, I don't know, there's maybe half a million, a million of us Russian speakers, right? And, you know, there's like Sergey Brin and stuff, but <laughs> many are not that well, you know, um, there's actually a very poor community that people don't think about when they think of Sergey Brin. And I really, and we grew up poor, and I kind of wanted to capture that experience because I think it's an important one. You know, whenever one superpower implodes and everyone comes running toward the other superpower, to me, that's an interesting story and that needs to be there. So in a sense, all I'm doing in this book a little bit too, this isn't a Russian centered book in the way that of course, Little Failure is or my first book, Russian Debutante's Handbook, but there is a lot of sort of me in my books trying to record this very particular, very peculiar, very sad community in some ways. And especially about the way parents and children can't quite get it together, which I know is, uh, you know, talking to a lot of my Russian friends of my generation, you know, um, a lot of my friends, I was talking to a friend of mine who's a Russian doctor, who can't get her parents to take COVID, to take the uh, vaccines, you know, and that's something true for many of us. Uh, they watch either Fox or Russian propaganda and the yeah. yeah. Kanal or whatever the channel is in Russia, and they're told, you know, millions have died from Pfizer and Moderna, so don't take this, you know, and they don't. And and so all of this is very, it's a very, it, these are very tough relationships because they're based on love, but they take a lot out of you, you know. And I know generation, generational relationships are hard, but these, and to me, I think sometimes the Russians have it even harder. I don't mean to, you know, play who has it hardest, but, you know, with, with my friends who are Korean immigrants or, or Indian immigrants, because they, they grew up at least with some connection to the West, you know, and most of these people grew up in middle to upper middle classes of those, of those societies. There's, they came with a little bit more knowledge of what a place like America would be, whereas for us, it just, they just never quite made the, the leap I think some of these parents, some parents are perfectly okay, of course, but, but the ones that I know very well are, are people that, you know, 
Can you imagine not getting this vaccine and you're having grandchildren, but not getting this vaccine almost to prove a political point and to listen to the same propaganda from Russia that you despised when you were growing up there? I mean, that takes a special kind of, a special kind of, yeah. Kind of, yeah, yeah, yeah. I made my uh, my mom read Little Failure, so that was oh, my own like little okay. <laughs> one little victory. So, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Spasibo, mom. Oh. We have one last question from Zoom um, from John, uh, who said that during the pandemic he dipped into Boccaccio's The Decameron about a group of friends who escaped the 14th century Black Death by retreating to a country home, where they traded body stories to ward off boredom. Did Boccaccio have any influence on your novel? <laughs> <laughs> I was just with Joyce, but go ahead. Um, <laughs> Joyce, now this Boccaccio dude shows up. What's happening? Um, yes, of course. I remember loving uh, the D. Cameron, and of course, there's a character named D. Cameron growing up. Um, um, and what I loved about it is that it was very funny. Uh, and very saucy. That's all about these, you know, um, immigrants. Um, sorry, immigrants. What am I sorry? Florentines. Oh God. Uh, I'm like from. They fled where? from Siena. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All these Sienese immigrants in there, and, and uh, I'm talking about monks having sex with you know girls and stuff like that. So for the first three quarters of the book. I was sort of on that wavelength, just people having fun. And then I guess you wanted to ask a question about it. So I'll, you know, for those who haven't read the New Yorker article, uh, something quite terrible happened to me. Uh, uh, when I came here a month after coming here from the Soviet Union, uh, my parents ran into some Chabadniks, followers of the Lubavitcher rabbi, and they demanded that I would be circumcised. And the circumcision did not work out well when I was seven. And last year, not to get too graphic, but you can read it in the New Yorker article, it's called uh, My Gentile Area is the name of the article. Uh, things completely fell apart. And for about half a year, I was in complete pain uh, and unable to move uh, and unable to do much. But just as that was starting to happen to me, I was getting to the part of the book where one of the characters encounters a lot of pain. So it was almost like on cue, you know, you, you, couldn't, you couldn't summon. You didn't it. have to ask your friend what's that flower, you just yeah. felt it. <laughs> like, yeah. I didn't have to Google pain. No, how, how exactly. Does it feel? exactly. Right? Uh, but being heard in such an intimate place, um, to the point, I began, I also was given uh, all these drugs, which didn't really help, but sent me down a spiral of hallucinations. Um, a feeling of disassociation, but not the pleasant ketamine type that, you know, youngsters like to snort in, in, in nightclubs, but rather a truly frightening, the opposite of a K-hole, like a Jewish, a J-hole, you know, <laughs> and <laughs> to the point where, uh, I, you know, yes, nothing worse than a J-hole. That's, that's not a good app, J-hole. <laughs> J-hole is the worst. <laughs> Sorry. If you go get circumcised as a seven-year-old, you may fall down a J-hole at 49. <laughs> the Moyles don't tell you this. They, you know, it's, they should have a thing where, you know, yeah. J-hole. Um, <laughs> but I began to be very disappointed. I didn't know what was happening. And, and, and I began having these strange dreams. dreams. Yeah, they're beautiful in the book, but you can tell they're very visceral. I would wake up and I would, first of all, I needed to write so badly because writing was other than hugging my little kid, writing was the only thing that kept my brain away from the pain. So I would, I would, um, you only can write, as you know, so you can write like three, four good hours a day. I would all crap after that, right? But I was so desperate for more, you know, I'd be like writing my agent, be like, can I write, I don't know, the history of the stapler for Stapler Monthly? I'm just like <laughs> dying to write anything, you know, because it would just keep my mind off things. Dave Eggers beat. Dave Eggers, yes. <laughs> Dave Eggers wrote a three piece. <laughs> Him and Franz and are doing this stapler retrospective. So, <laughs> you know, it was, it was this endless battle to keep my mind occupied because if I were to think about it, and, and I began to feel, so in the, in the article for the New Yorker, I began to talk to my friends and I discovered that even among a very small group of them, quite a few had usually exes whose relationship had, grow, had, this, had fallen apart because of botched circumcisions. So I had found out that this was actually not that rare. Mm. And I began to dig deeper. And today my inbox is just filled with men who tell me that, you know, and, and they're too afraid to come out and say anything about it. Because do you get, you, do, you, do you feel in terms of all the fan letters, you've not fan <laughs> letters, well, let me try to rephrase. You're broken. Cir <laughs> circumvent that. Um. Circumcise that. <laughs> um, but just, uh, um, you know, 
you know, obviously people are fans of all your books and stuff like <laughs> that and you get you know but do you feel like there's been an influx with this more than the other things you've written yes Where people oh, are sure. like oh me too oh, me too me no, too right no absolutely they want to relate you know and texts from mothers who are, oh. whose children have had botched circumcisions who are you know very feeling very guilty about this right um and the american medical community has always uh, affirmed this of course angry moils from all of you know uh, as, as you would imagine after that article you know there's that joke you know in germany uh the germans will never forgive the jews for the holocaust uh and the same thing you know the moils will never forgive yeah. me for my botched circumcision um, oh yeah that's parallel so you know all, all this different stuff that i'm discovering and now now people are really interested in this and like you know john hopkins just emailed me and they they want me to present my penis to johns hopkins and, <laughs> you know, uh, are you going to be attached to the penis or are you just going to ship it at, at this point just i hope not i hope they, they can take it they can take it off no I, I, at one point i remember during the pain i was saying to my wife should i just remove it and she yeah said, that's in the piece she, that's in the piece and she yeah. and she was like eh, you know <laughs> Let's She's hold like, on to it for a little bit. Yeah. yeah we can see if we can do that. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So, but I feel very, I feel a little bit responsible because now that I'm learning the scope of the problem, I feel like, and I'm not saying stop circumcisions. I'm saying let's talk about this more. And I've, right. I know rabbis have been writing in and saying they're going to present a different take on this now. They're no longer going to push their congress to do it. They're going to say there's two sides to this, and they're going to right. maybe present my article as, as something that can also happen. So that's been very. That's one of the things that throughout this pain, two things happened. One is Novel. I think I, I think I gave me a new level. Of, of writing about suffering in a way mm -hmm. that is very important to me. Uh, and also this article hopefully can, can you know, oh, sorry, this, oldest, we went all the way off. We went all the way, yeah, sorry, off the, yeah, yeah, the yeah, oldest yeah, surgery yeah. on the It's on one the of the oldest planet. surgeries. It's performed by uh, many groups. Doesn't mean people. it's performed well, but it is Doesn't the oldest. Doesn't mean it's performed well. It's not, it's not, you know, many Jews think it, it, it originated with the ancient Israelites. It didn't. It was actually uh, an Egyptian test of yeah. strength. Uh, to become a noble in the society, 13-year-olds or so were held down while they're, uh, yeah. foreskin was forcibly removed and if you didn't cry out you were noble you were you know admitted into this group so uh and many people i talk to still think of it as a test of strength this is how i became jewish by 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 suffering as a seven-year-old or a ten-year-old this is how i proved myself so there's um, a lot to talk about and, and I it's wanna, yeah there's I a lot to move it's, toward the, yeah. writing some books and getting a, a margarita but yeah i was about to say yeah. i was like yeah. and that is why in conclusion you should read this novel <laughs> <laughs> There are no was circumcisions, that, that very no botch circumcisions done? in this novel. Everyone's <laughs> genitalia is perfect. Totally intact. Does totally that ruin intact. It? I don't want to ruin it for everybody, but everybody. And, and there's leaves. a lot of good sex. In there's this also, book. there is actually. There are awesome sex involving it's hard masks to write. at one point. So. It's hard to write good sex. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's, yeah, well done. Okay, wow. 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 We wow. did good. We did good. Thank you, Sloan. Thank, Thank you, Frank. Thank you guys Thank you, for coming. Thank you, Brooklyn.